Barbara Liao's sudden and unexpected death left a gaping void in the Capellan Confederation government. Both of her sons had been killed during the Callaway debacle, leaving only her granddaughter Ilsa in the direct line of succession. Normally after the death of a chancellor, the commonality prefects would meet on Cyan to confirm the heir as their new head of state. There was no talk of usurping House Liao, but Ilsa, not even yet a teenager, was clearly too young to rule. The decision was made to elect the Duke of Sidious, Sandor Quinn, as Chancellor Regent until Ilsa reached her majority. While Quinn's campaign against the Chesterton Worlds had won him popular support, as the prefect of the Tikhonov commonality, his interests lay solely in that region of space. The counter-offensives Barbara and the Stratahios had been planning against the Free Worlds League fell by the wayside, as the Chancellor Regent focused on his ongoing battle against Tau Stavian. With Seacaf reinforcements arriving in April to secure the captured systems, the Liao Lancers were dispatched to conquer the last Fed Suns holdouts on the path to Terra, the former hegemony planets of Kaf and Den of Katos. The Spinwood attack group moved on to Sanilac, taking the world two months later. Quinn's mercenaries then seized Sonya in October, further expanding the Chesterton commonality after a one-month battle. Sporadic fighting continued within the Bolan Thumb, with the Lyrans launching raids against Ilion, Marsal, and Talarska. They also moved against Kamens, the fanatic defenders again fighting to the bitter end. The planet was finally secure come January, by which point news was filtering in from across the inner sphere. For starters, the Oberon Confederation, one of the remnants of the old Rimwell's Republic, had collapsed. The Lyran Intelligence Corps had been working to destabilize various warlords operating out of the ruins of the Republic, and the breakup of the Oberon worlds was their greatest coup, giving Steiner one less thing to worry about on their periphery border. Reports that other remnants of the older Maris Empire had come together to form Edom's bandits entering service with the Free Worlds League also reached Steiner's desk. Furthermore, word of Minoru Kirita's death reached the Archon. This was both a blessing and a curse. The coordinator had been despised within the Commonwealth, but his son Jinjiro was by all accounts even worse. The only saving grace was that he appeared to be fully committed to exterminating House Davian, and barely spared a thought for his Lyran neighbour. Throughout the latter half of 2796 and into the next year, the reserve units within the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery were busy carrying out the final orders of their deceased coordinator, Minoru. Several new commands had been raised in preparation for the assault on New Avalon, and some of these would soon see action for the first time there. To prevent any sort of encirclement from Davian troops within what was left of the Draconis March, they pushed out in a spinward direction, taking more territory in the Fairfax and Kestrel combat regions, and even moved into the Woodbine operational area adjacent to the Outworlds Alliance. No one knew it at the time, but this would be the high watermark for the entire campaign. As word of the Kintari massacre began to reach the troops on the front line, they were shocked into immobility. The news from the Capellan front was equally disastrous for House Davian. Sandal Quinn continued his mercenary first, regular second strategy to take Taos in June. That same year, the Chancellor Regent launched an audacious new offensive out of the St. Ives commonality, establishing two salients deep into the Federated Suns, even reaching as far as the New Avalon combat region. The Certis Fusiliers attempted to counterattack at Ogilvy, but were beaten back by the Chevaux Leger. By October, accounts of the Cantari massacre had spread across the inner sphere. The reaction among the soldiers of the AFFS was the same as it was for civilians of their realm – disgust and fury. Not waiting for orders from the First Prince or High Command, those units stationed on Godrich lashed out at the neighbouring Logandale and Marlette. Davian had not successfully liberated a single world from the dragon up to this point in the war, but whipped into a frenzy by the awful news coming from Cantari IV, they successfully pushed the demoralised DCMS off-world that November. The same unsanctioned attacks occurred at Bristol soon after, and then Delavan and Odell in December. 
John Davian and his son Joshua were on nearby Ipava, making their own plans for a coordinated counteroffensive in early December. They were pleased to hear of the destruction of a pair of Draconis Combine Admiralty destroyers at Delavan, their initial target, from the spontaneous assaults of loose cannons within their armed forces. Giving tacit approval to the initiative shown by their commanders, the two hoped to support the attack and reclaim the worlds for the Federated Sons. Their fleeting hope of victory turned to ash when the first prince and his heir were assassinated at their field base on December 9th, 2797. Who hired the assassin remains a mystery to this day. The most obvious culprits are Jinjiro Kirita or Sandal Quinn, but other fringe possibilities include members of the Federated Sun's military or government, Comstar, or even relatives within House Davian who hope to gain power themselves. Ultimately, whatever destabilizing effect their death might have been predicted to have did not come to be, as the 19-year-old Paul Davian ascended to the throne and would prove in time to be one of the realm's greatest leaders. As an aside, John's death also left Kenyon the Eagle as the last of the Star League era successor lords. 2798 got underway with the capture of Ulaanbaatar in January by Blanford's Grenadiers, the premier unit of the Tikhonov commonality. Sandal Quinn himself visited the front the following month to award his troops with medals for their excellent performance and conduct during the campaign. Sandal was adamant that to have any hope of winning the support of the lost Chesterton worlds, his troops mustn't use weapons of mass destruction. Later that year, his army would capture the planets Everett and Goshen, and even dared to seize Shadar from the Draconis Combine. The Chancellor Regent's reserved, even gentlemanly conduct was very out of character for the First Succession War, perhaps only mirrored by Hasseldorf's Boland campaign. On that front, Lyran troops landed on Talarska in March, reclaiming the world after a three-month battle. Elsewhere on the front, Paul Steiner continued his ineffectual raiding campaign along the rest of the Commonwealth's borders. After becoming First Prince, Paul Davian immediately went about strengthening his position at home. Over the course of a three-year period known as the Reformation, he would transform the way the Federated Sons was governed. In the era of the Star League, whenever the First Lord had visited the Davian capital, he had been granted several honorary powers under the title of Duke of New Avalon. When Paul's grandfather John had proclaimed himself the new First Lord at the onset of the Succession Wars, he had also unwittingly assumed that same ducal position. Paul was the first to see just how significant that could be in the governance of his realm. The first power it gave him was the right to call or dismiss any meeting of the High Council, as well as speak first at those meetings. While these abilities were largely meaningless to a Cameron ruler who might only make a couple of visits in their lifetime, it was an enormous boon to the Davian First Prince. He had effectively gained the ability to completely circumvent his own government and rule as an absolute monarch should he choose. House Cameron had also been given dominion over 30 backwater systems. In exchange for lending the funds to develop the fledgling colonies, they would become his personal holdings for a short period, until they were self-sufficient and exchanged for a new batch. When the relationship between the two families cooled after the Second Hidden War, the practice largely died off, during which time some of these planets became economic powerhouses. They were now part of Paul Davian's personal fief. Coupled with his right as First Prince to grant knighthoods and landholds, he could partition out or sell off these wealthy provinces to secure whatever funding or support he needed. Meanwhile, the impromptu raids continued along the front. Between February and October, the AFFS succeeded in driving the Curitans off Arcadia, Coloma, Saginaw and Strawn. With their loss, the Draconis Combine could no longer reach New Avalon in just a single jump. Paul was quick to congratulate his military on their success, winning support among their ranks. He urged them to treat any POWs with respect, a move that coupled with the collapsing morale among the ranks of the mustard soldiery, led many units to surrender without a fight. Disappointed in the performance of the Department of Military Intelligence, 
Paul Davian demanded that any information gathered from defecting Curitans be sent back to him personally. He used this wealth of intel to establish a new civilian intelligence agency, the Ministry of Information, Intelligence and Operations. With Paul offering generous rewards and even land grants, the MIIO quickly established itself as one of the most efficient spy networks within the inner sphere, returning Davian's investment tenfold. Within the Draconis Combine, one of the Star League's most famous units was having a crisis of conscience. The Eridani Light Horse had remained behind when Alexander Kerensky led the SLDF into exile, maintaining a watchful vigil from their home base on Trondheim. When word of the Kintari massacre reached them, Ezra Bradley and his other colonels could no longer sit idle as the inner sphere collapsed into chaos around them. On June 5th, Bradley declared that they would be leaving the Combine and taking up service as mercenaries within the Free Worlds League. The coordinator had been courting the Eridani Light Horse for years, even before Kerensky's exodus. To lose them now would have been a major blow. Col de Giro, the planetary administrator for Sendai, home of the 151st Light Horse, suspected that Jinjiro Kirita would see him killed if he allowed them to depart and so took drastic action to prevent that from happening. On the 13th of June, he took the families of the 50th Heavy Cavalry and 8th Recon Battalions hostage, just as they were preparing to lift off. He gave the unit 72 hours to return, or else he would execute his prisoners. On the 16th, with the Eridani Light Horse still heading for the jump point, he went through with his threat. In a fit of rage, the battalion commanders went against orders and returned to Sendai. Over the course of a week, they devastated any and all Combine soldiers they came across and ruined several cities in the bargain. Those responsible were either killed outright or captured only to face a firing squad soon after, including Col de Giro. Comstar further cemented their reputation as saviours among the common people by helping to evacuate 12,000 civilians during the battle. With vengeance extracted, the Eridani Light Horse resumed their journey towards the Free Worlds League. The unbridled attacks undertaken by Davian troops in the immediate aftermath of the Kintari massacre tapered off in 2799 as supplies began to run out. Increasingly, the raiders were returning after a defeat, though Paul was sure to prioritise his most successful units for resupply first. In the last two months of 2798, AFFS units acting on their own initiative made landfall on Bremond and Tancredi, driving the Combine off early in the new year, just as others moved to reclaim Fairfax in March. The regional capital was successfully liberated after a gruelling six-month battle, Meanwhile, the garrison on Chesterton were busy preparing for the worst, fortifying their positions and building up stores to outlast a siege. They were quite surprised when the first Liao ships appeared in the system, carrying not an invasion force, but emissaries from the Chancellor Regent. Sandal Quinn had them effectively surrounded. Though he had the necessary forces to take the planet, it would be an enormously costly battle for both sides not to mention the planet itself. Sandal was prepared to accept their surrender on generous terms. The Davian commander, uncowed by the threat of his imminent destruction, made his position clear. If the Seacath landed on Chesterton, he would unleash his full arsenal of WMDs in mutually assured destruction. Not willing to render such a symbolic prize inhospitable, Quinn instead ordered his forces to maintain a blockade. Taking little interest in events around Chesterton, or any military affairs for that matter, was Ilsa Liao. The only brief action she saw was a two-month service with the Red Lancers on Mirak. Privately, this suited Quinn just fine. While a loyal supporter of House Liao, he was quite content to be a wartime leader, commanding his forces from the front while his teenage ward built up a power base of her own among the nobility back on Cyan. The Duke of Sirius had become, and would likely remain, the de facto head of the Capellan Confederation Armed Forces long after Ilsa had taken over as head of state. Throughout his term in office, the Chancellor Regent had used his commonality's enormous industrial output to expand the armed forces considerably. 
The number of units under his command peaked in 2799, with the creation of nine new regiments, split between several brigades. Additionally, the Confederation hired the services of Narhal's raiders, veterans of the Starleaf Civil War from both sides of the conflict. Unfortunately for Quinn, the AWFS scuppered his plan to starve Chesterton of support when an unsanctioned attack on Sanilac became the first battle to liberate one of the Capellan Games during the First Succession War. 2799 was the year when Commandant General Hasseldorf's Bolan campaign finally ran out of steam. After taking Marsal earlier in the year, the conquest of Ilion could only go ahead with additional support from mercenaries. Even still, it bogged down so badly that his commanders were forced to use tactical warheads to win the day, at the cost of both his marks and the viability of the planet. In the last few years, the Lyrans had also taken a pair of systems closer to Terra. Thaddeus Maddox set about reconquering the first of these in 2799. His attack on Alula Australis was so swift that the defending mercenaries did not have a chance to escape off-world when the Maddox Air arrived with overwhelming force. To protect the region from further Steiner aggression, another new province was formed, the Border Protectorate. They adopted the stranded mercenaries as their provincial forces, the Steel Guards, and later incorporated the existing Iron Guards as their own too. The Draconis Combine had continued to chip away at the Lyran Commonwealth in what had become a secondary front for both parties. The most significant event to occur happened in November 2799, when the field command post on Lamar, the General of the Army's Paul Steiner, was hit by a nuclear strike. Publicly, the Archon was greatly angered by the death of his uncle, but privately, he might have thanked the Curitans responsible. Unfortunately, Richard didn't have many better officers to replace him, turning to the underwhelming Amanda Lestrade to take over command of the LCAF. She was able to win back three of the worlds the dragon had taken in the last few years, but otherwise scaled back her predecessor's raiding campaign. Things started to turn against the Capellan Confederation at the turn of the century. As the Draconis Combine had advanced, and the two nations had seized large chunks of the Terran hegemony, they developed a shared border. Minoru Kirita had rejected Barbara Liao's proposal for an alliance, but the two had not directly engaged each other beyond light probing raids until Sandal Quinn moved on Shadar. The DCMS now hit back at Ronal, securing the planet for the dragon after a short one-month campaign. For the second time in the war, the Ariana Grenadiers were virtually wiped out. Another wild AWFS strike landed on Tawas in July, liberating the planet in September, just as the Dieron regulars made another strike at Rio. This time, at least, the Capellans were able to push them back a month later. After taking over as General of the Armies, Amanda Lestrade set about making her mark on the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces. To take some of the initiative back, she brought the stealths over to the Curitan Front, and also hired another mercenary regiment for deep strikes. One of her first changes was to broaden the list of viable targets for raids to include civilian life support structures, such as water purifiers, weather stabilizers, and atmospheric processors. The LIC was quick to create propaganda that included examples of enemy strikes at similar infrastructure within the Commonwealth to whitewash the extreme tactic. In November, word reached the Archon of a shocking revelation. Duke Graham Kelswar and his Tamar Tigers had survived the botched raid on Benjamin and had spent the last six years conducting a guerrilla campaign out of the mountains. An investigation revealed that early unsubstantiated reports had been covered up by Paul Steiner, possibly as a means to prevent his rival's return to the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, the Archon could not in good reason order a rescue operation that stood such little chance of success. The news reached them just two months before the Tamar Hazars made their final stand. Infiltrating the capital city and partnering with several criminal elements within, the last company of the Tigers were able to hold off repeated attempts to root them out for almost a week. By the battle's end, the city was in ruins and a full regiment of the DCMS had been destroyed. 
Ilse Liao's 18th birthday was fast approaching as 2801 began. Some have suggested that the Chancellor Regent considered fighting to retain his office, but such a move would never have had the support of the Capellan government. Instead, he made preparations for the handover. The troops within the two salients pushing out of St. Ives were recalled and the worlds given back to Davian. Elsewhere, the CCAF was ordered to hunker down while the transition occurred. On April 19th, Sandal Quinn stepped down to become strategic military advisor, while Ilse Liao took up the reins as Chancellor, leading the Capellan Confederation into a new era. Thank you for watching today's episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a little bit of a shorter one this time round. I said back at the start there's going to be 15 chapters. If you've not been following the Patreon updates, I've already combined four of them into two of the episodes that released earlier, just because I felt like they were too short at only 10-11 minutes each. Nothing's been cut from the project at all, it just means that we're going to have fewer individual episodes. What that means for us is that after today's episode, there's only five more chapters to come out. Uh, of the last six in the series, five of them are these 20 minute episodes and I think there's one more that's going to be a 30 minute one. So we're closer to the end now than you might think. I think overall runtime is probably going to come to a little over five hours or so. The next episode in the series is going to take us up to the end of 2807. It focuses primarily on internal strife within the Free Wells League. There's some power plays going on between House Manic and House Allison. Uh, which leads to uh, a bit of a disaster along the, the Liao front. Thanks very much for watching guys. If you enjoyed the video, please leave me a like, a comment, subscribe to the channel if you want to keep seeing more videos like this one, and I hope you'll join me again next weekend for the ninth episode, Politics at Play. <laughs>